Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest is Oliver Stone, who makes movies as a producer, screenwriter, and director. His movies, Platoon, Born on the Fourth of July, JFK, Nixon, Between Heaven and Earth, and Salvador, to name a few, are in a sense conversations with history. Intense, provocative, thoughtful, they are cinema which jolts our senses and stretches our imagination, forcing us to confront our delusions about who we are. Mr. Stone has been nominated for 10 Academy Awards and has won three Oscars for writing Midnight Express and directing Born on the Fourth of July and Platoon. Mr. Stone served in Vietnam, was wounded twice, and received the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star. Mr. Stone, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you, Harry. I'm curious, does your, did your I I I experience in Vietnam make it inevitable that you would work with historical materials in your movies? I think that anyone who lives through his life, I mean, is going to end up dealing with his history. And his history sometimes interacts with public events. And I think some, often in my life, my private sector has kind of come into collision with the public sector. And, and I'm looking back at my life, and I realize the, uh, the, uh, the toll, you know, the, the toll that I had to pay, or that my generation had to pay to get through that, that period was unnecessary, you see. It was unnecessary because it was all political, a series of expedient, I think, expedient political decisions by Johnson and, and Nixon. And it changed the course of, of our life and our time and forever. And, and, and it's hard to get back because once you've lost that spot of innocence, perhaps, that you had, when Kennedy got killed and then Nixon uh, performed his, you know, his, uh, his acts, his sinister designs, all that shaped, that shaped us to the way we are now. You too. I mean, and we're all shaped by it. Life became what it did in America as a result of that. And that's what's fascinating. How do you avoid it? You make movies about historical periods that you can avoid it. You can make, I guess, m comedies where there's no social interaction. Although even Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, posits an economic uh, strata. That, that Jim Carrey has to exist at an economic uh, level. There's no question that he's, he's never running out of money, even if he's a cable guy. But I mean, all those questions arise. On any film, there's always a historical implication. Uh, well, one can say in a way that your experience gave you the view from the bottom up. Uh, what, is, what is quite uh, amazing about Platoon and about uh, uh, Born on the Fourth of July, it's really the experience of the people, the soldiers, who felt these these decisions from the bottom up. Would you comment on that? Yeah. That's probably perhaps one of the most significant things I learned over there was that you know, there's a sort of a, a perceived life that you get when you're, re when you're raised. So those college students get it. Mm -hmm. uh, you read it in books. You, 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 your thinking is, is, is perceptions that have been taught to you. Very Pavlovian in a way. And when, you get, when I got to the infantry, I really saw life uh, smack up in, in front of my face. It was a non-cerebral exercise. Six inches in front of my face, survive. You have to rely on your sense, your smell, your sight. All your senses you come into play tactile. And as a result, you never can go quite back. Once you get into that path, it's very hard to realize that you, the, the perceived opinion path is being, uh, th that which you hear from others is never, it's a question of what is authentic in your life, finally. What, what, are, what are your real feelings? How do you really feel about the way you are, how are you are alive, what you're here for? Once you ask yourself these questions, they're all Socratic ones, I guess, but once you get into that arena, how do you go back into believing what they tell you? And, and I think you, you really believe, in, and you seem to indicate this in a speech at Berkeley a few years ago, that in, in recording the pain and the suffering, that that, that is an entree po a point for the audience to experience a catharsis and for uh, uh, the American people, in the case of your movies, to, to experience uh, uh, the trauma that was Vietnam. Those are heavy words, Harry. I, you know, you don't set out to do that. You set out to be authentic to yourself and to put it down the way you, you feel it and you know it and you interpret it. And then others sometimes uh, key into the, can key into it and get it. But a lot of people can see my movies and, and they tell me they enjoy them or they don't, but they don't, you know, they don't get into a deeper, they don't get into a deeper analysis. Some people will say I was very moved by the picture, but may not even pers understand what feelings that were working on them. Natural Born Killers, for example, evoked a very strong uh, 
negative feeling in people. And I thought that that is the same thing to me as positive because it's just a working out of feeling, you know, that they were f uh, vomiting, regurgitating at the picture. People who saw Born on the Fourth of July were healed. They said that they were healed because they felt that they were restructured. I don't know how true that is, but the films work at you on an emotional level and you make of it what you can. And, and uh, catharsis, you know, what is catharsis to me? It's, it's an old academic term, first of all. Uh, do we, uh, does that mean you're supposed to go to the play and you live all your life in front of your eyes, it flashes before you, you participate with the protagonist, and at the end of the, at the, end of the deal, you're cleansed in some way and, because you've been moved and terrorized, so you're cleansed by having felt those emotions. I suppose that would be the most perfect definition of it. So if that can happen in a movie, that would be great. It would be great. And these movies are like Greek dramas. These are our Greek dramas. These are our shards on the Etruscan, on the Greek vases that will, will endure. I hope. I hope movies endure. And, and the remarkable thing about Platoon and, and Born in the USA, you were the first one to tell the, the stories of the, of, I'm sorry, boy, boy, right, sorry, uh, Born on the Foot. You were essentially the first one to tell the story you know, on the screen of the soldier in Vietnam and what he actually experienced, the soldier when he returned home. Well, that's not quite true. Coming Home had been made before and, you know, Apocalypse Now and uh, Deer Hunt, different kinds of movies. I tried to do, uh, I, in Platoon, I was authentic to my own feelings as much as I could be within the dramatic form that I was creating. And in uh, Ron Kovic's Born on the Fourth of July, I was very, uh, I, I was very close with Ron, still am, or was until recently, and I, I was able to really, I like, I asked him to co-write the screenplay and to put his real feelings there. His real feelings about his father and his mother and his country. And he was very, uh, very angry man. But I, I, I see Born on the Fourth of July ultimately as one of my best movies. I just think it, uh, I like the way he reintegrates himself at the end of the movie. He finds his path, uh, which is not that far from where he started actually. Because he was very zealous as a boy, but he was very zealous in the end of his life too. In some ways, you're both radical and conservative. In other words, your movies shake people up, but, but uh, it, it, their, their goal seems to be also to restore the community to itself and its true story. Again, those are big words. I mean, you, <laughs> you've got to work, you know, you, you don't set out to, you know, movies got to make money. You've got to work, you've got to make them so they're exciting, they're gripping, mm -hmm. people want to go see them. That's, a, you know, that's a very hard thing to do because people are more and more jaded, it seems, from mm -hmm. the hours of television and the, mo the, the, the speed of modern life. So how do you make it exciting to tell a story where perhaps, you first of all, you got a character. you got to make the character strong so people can follow that. And then hopefully that character can, re can integrate with the background of a social uh, situation that, it, that people can recognize. You know? mm -hmm. I'd love to do uh, historical pictures more. But I don't know if I can. I mean, I'd like to do a story about the medieval ages where every scene you'd sort of feel like you were in, in the 12th century. And it'd be great to get that feeling. One of my fantasies in my life has been that I was granted access with a camera to go back in time and to film the actual campaign of Alexander crossing the, uh, uh, into, into India through Iran and Persia. And I wanted to, and I, I swear if I came back with that film and put it out there, that I would be attacked on all sides uh, as being by unrealistic the, by the historians for having uh, per, uh, distorted the truth. I, I guarantee you, if I had been there, uh, that that's what that would have happened. Well, let's talk about that because as you work between uh, narr personal narrative and historical narrative, uh, one runs into the problem. Let's look at Nixon, for example, where you you've told the story, Nixon's personal story, and created a character who's a Nixon for all time. On the other hand, you have historical facts in there that may be proven wrong, specifically whether Nixon was the instigator or the, the, uh, of the mongoose operation to assassinate Castro and other leaders. Thirty years from now, uh, memos prove that he wasn't involved in mongoose. But uh, at the same time, you created a, a great piece of art. How do you want people to look at that movie in the future when you, they know that you're wrong about Nixon and Mongoose, but you're right about Nixon's character. I'd like to, there's two, there's two different questions. First of all, in terms of memos, uh, probably all the memos that have come to light on Nixon's involvement have already come to light. That's to say his involvement in staff meetings, National Security Council, the people that he signed off on. We know that he was around the edges of it. And that's the most we'll ever find out. Mm -hmm. The contrary is true. As time progresses, you will feel less and less memo. There's no memo that's going to come up and say, uh, 
uh, Nixon was uh, instigated the assassination of Castro. But we mm -hmm. do know that Nixon was heavily involved and knew of the invasion of Cuba. Mm -hmm. Correct? So right, correct. Here is yeah. a very practical man. He's Vice President of the United mm -hmm. States. He knows the military. He knows John Foster Dulles, the CIA. He knows everybody. Mm -hmm. Do you think that when they can contemplate an invasion of a country, they do not contemplate the assassination of a leader? Mm -hmm. It's the first thing any, any semi-intelligent uh, military mind would have to think of. So it's inevitable that, to me, it's a combination. It's a, Nixon, of course, they, of course they thought of Castro. And they tried. In, in fact, uh, the interesting thing in the Nixon is how close he is. Anthony Summers is coming out with a book next year. It's going to be fascinating. Uh, Nixon is very close to Mayu, Bob Mayu, and Mayu instigated the plots, uh, not with, gangst with the gangsters, but prior to, the, prior to Mayu, the CIA was doing it on its own in 19, March 1960. What did Nixon know of Lumumba? What did he know of Guatemala back in 54? Nixon was the most traveled vice president we ever had. He spent a lot of time hanging out abroad because uh, Eisenhower didn't want him around domestically. If that's the case, don't you think he, he was not wasting his time? Nixon was a brilliant man. But let, let's just... All right, now, that's... A, okay, yeah. question two. Let's say I'm dead wrong mm -hmm. and uh, time goes on. Fine. Mm -hmm. What you know, what I did, I never put out a history. I put out a dramatic history, and that was labeled as such. Mm -hmm. I have the right to interpretation as a dramatist. I, I research. It's my responsibility to find the research. It's my responsibility to digest it and do the best I can with it. But at a certain point, that responsibility will become uh, an interpretation. And I will move on into closed doors meetings. I will invent dialogue. I will create the fabric of a historical drama. I'll come out with my interpretation. And if I'm wrong, fine. It'll become part of the uh, detritus of history. It'll be mm. part of the give and take. You know, the play will either, the, the movie will either work on its own terms as a drama in 2100, mm -hmm. or it will also be perceived as having been historically per, uh, perceptive. Shakespeare's dramas, f thank God for him, lasted better as dramas than they did as history plays, didn't they? But that's not to say that we're wrong today. Do you, do you worry about the fact that, that uh, young people may not know history, read history, and, but in fact see your movies, know your movie, and come to believe that they're absolutely true? I hear that all the time. It's, it's an amazingly, uh, to me, superficial uh, uh, statement because, first of all, it implies that uh, the teaching community has failed utterly to, well, that may be to, true. to, uh, <laughs> to share a sense of history with their students. But secondly, movies have always existed to me as illusions. And I've always accepted them as such. When I was a child, I'd see a movie. I took it for what it was. I enjoyed it. And if I believed it, I would tend to be more interested in knowing more about it. Lawrence of Arabia. I went out and I bought Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Uh, Robert Bolt's story, I mean, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, man, all, man for All Seasons. All, every historical film that has been made has been called into question in some way. But generally speaking, the non-literal uh, person, the person who would enjoy a movie, would tend to view a movie as a first draft and would, would, would deepen his perception with, with reading around it. I mean, books are another medium, they, and books can go into more depth. But don't tell me for one second that a person who writes a book uh, is more objective than a person who makes a movie. I don't buy that, because so many historians have, have access to grind and have subjected their own uh, judgment to their own uh, perception and their own uh, subjectivity and partisanship in some cases. Uh, it goes on all the time. And every history, in fact, is an omission of facts because there are, so many, there are too many facts to put in any history. And if you, you as a, you're not a historian, but any, most historians will tell you that they ha make very discreet judgments as to what facts to omit in order to make their book uh, into a, some shape, some length that can be managed. Compare the character of Garrison and JFK and, and Nixon and Nixon. Do you think that uh, the portrayal of, of Nixon uh, has greater depth? Uh, different and, and a different you, motive, different yeah. motive, different objective. I never set out with JFK to make a character study of Jim Garrison, who mm -hmm. I knew and I admired. I used uh, Garrison as one of four threads. I mean, the movie is hung on Garrison because, first of all, it was the he was the only public official to do something about the mm -hmm. damn thing. And secondly, uh, based on his book, there was a story of a family that was falling apart. But that, if I had gone into the family life in detail, the relationship between Sissy Spacek and Kevin and the children, the movie would have been five hours long because there was no way that I could do Dealey Plaza, mm -hmm. the Oswald background, and then, of course, the Mr. X character based on Fletcher Prouty, mm -hmm. played by Donald Sutherland. I couldn't do those other stories. Uh, so the movie was crafted in a way that it, it welded together four disparate stories into one. It's a very interesting, uh, non-almost 
nonlinear kind of uh, film, mm -hmm. and kind of postmodern in the way it was made. The people missed a lot of people. Historians missed the point of the movie. First of all, if you see it once, uh, you, you, sometimes you misperceive. Second time, it's very clear that you know it doesn't say anything about a hundred corporations or a hundred people getting in a room and, and conspiring. It's, it's much more uh, intelligent and sophisticated than that. But secondly, it, the movie itself is about the veil of reality that we have around us. The whole first hour of uh, 45 minutes of JFK is based on television perception of Kennedy's death at Dealey Plaza. If you look closely at the movie, it's all television, television, people are reacting. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because that's the way we got it back in 63. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the movie is a tearing down of that veil. And the technique of the movie is done in that deconstructivist style of, like, what is reality? Question it. Think for yourself. You never know. Mm -hmm. Everything is subject to uh, manipulation. Everything. Your life, the country, murder. Uh, and as such, it, it becomes a uh, very uh, uh, a portrait of, of uh, uh, that, that puts you in the mirror looking at yourself, which is a disturbing portrait. That's why, at the end of the movie, Costner turns right into camera. And he sort of says, it's up to you. It's an old 30s technique, but it's, it's powerful. So I fished up you know, these new techniques. And I think people were shocked. And they said, well, you invented fake footage and, and passed it off as real. Not mm -hmm. so. What is real? We still have a hard time discerning what is real in this Warren Commission mess that they did. They didn't examine the body. Mm -hmm. They didn't really do a, any kind of a job of investigation. They had Hoover and Dulles were appointed mm -hmm. on, on the Warren Commission. That was a joke. That's like asking the fox to watch the chicken coop. They were, and there was a, ultimately the ballistic, uh, the ballistic suspicions that were arisen by you know, the impossibility of taking that kind of shot from that window. Do you, do you get frustrated by the, the and lack... And there's a film, by the way, too, which is one of the great historic documents of all time. It's one of the great moments of right, history. Right, and I, I think you were the first one to actually show the couple of frames where the, the bullet has its impact, right? I, I had a, well, no, I, we tried. We did a lot of high-definition work. We slowed it down, but I don't think we get... I'm sure we could do a better, even a better job right now. But, but were you the first one to show the scenes where his... We showed, the, it, we yeah, showed it down. Yeah. Very, uh, it was shown briefly here and there. It was shown yeah, in, you know, on was, TV, it, yeah, but okay. never, uh, never examined in the detail that Costner examines it yeah. in the movie. Are you surprised at yourself at, at the depth of your portrayal of Nixon? It's almost sympathetic oh, they, you know, in places. Yeah, I think too much so sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Nixon is... That was a different purpose. Again, we were trying to go to the root of, a, of power the root of this man who had this power, who, had in, who inherited it from over the dead bodies of the two Kennedys, and what he did with it. And at the end of the day, it, it was really clear that a lot of the problems of Richard Nixon were very personal and, and, and were, he distorted himself in a sense, and uh, became ultra, instead of taking grace from power and doing uh, something better with his power, uh, he distorted it into a darker, uh, darker side. That's what was interesting about the man. That's why we sort of sought to do his background, his mother and his father, where he grew up. The deaths of his two brothers is a crucial issue in his life. What made this man, this Richard III character, who really he's closer to that than anything, who America inherited, mm -hmm. and he almost took the kingship, like Richard III did in the Shakespeare play, mm -hmm. actually. He took the kingship and made it into a mirror. Mm -hmm. That's all he did. Mm -hmm. It was all about Richard Nixon. It was never really about the country. I find that a fascinating thing. I mean, in a sense, you could say all men of power do that. I think Lyndon Johnson was very vain. I really do. Mm -hmm. I think that Lyndon Johnson was like in that, was it Snow White? Uh, tell me, fair one, who was the, who was the prettiest in all right, the land, right. all that. I mean, I think Lyndon Johnson had a lot of that, too. But Nixon was the uh, supremely complicated version of Lyndon Johnson. I think Lyndon Johnson did not have the brain power, a wattage of Nixon or Kennedy. In a speech at Berkeley uh, uh, about two years ago at a commencement, you, you, you seem to be saying that your art was an effort to, to restore uh, a spiritual element to American life, to, to probe these national traumas, the assassination of a president, the fall of a president, uh, the making of, of Vietnam policy and so on, uh, to, to explore it in a way to expose people to the trauma, but, it, but in such a way that it, it restored a spiritual element in essence, to our sense of community. Do you still hold that, or have I misrepresented what you said? 
Well, again, the, uh, you know, perhaps that's the effect of the movies, but you, those are awful big words to start mm -hmm. up with up front. You know, you don't set out to, to, you do the best job you can. You take it step by step. It's hard enough to make a movie. If it works, that's great. If it means something beyond the moment to somebody, they can take it and it lasts through the years. You know, we'll see. My movies are still relatively only 10 years old still. Mm -hmm. Or actually, Midnight Express, it's almost 20. But, but let's say uh, Salvador and Platoon were done 10 years ago. So I would love... My, I said once that I, the, I hate in the movies uh, the most is marketing them, going out and when they open being there. I wish I could jump ahead like three years or five years mm -hmm. and just forget all that controversy, all that, that nonsense that gets said. I've been misquoted, out of context. I mean, people really have a thing, you know. They, they think that I'm trying to brainwash their kids. I mean, they get crazy. Well, why is that? Why do you think that you, this reputation, is it just the distortion of the media? Is it that people can't understand well, the subtleties of your media? That's a long question, yeah. Mary. And I mean, a long, <laughs> long, long yeah. answer. And there's various, uh, you, I don't think I'd be prepared to give that right now. But uh, there, there's, you know, those who protest too much have to, uh, you know, you must ask yourself why. Mm -hmm. You must, you know, there's uh, many motives. And, and look, in this brief discussion, you, you've talked about what you do and, and your role as, as that of an artist. You're a storyteller. You're a, a, a historian in a way. And, and you know, th there it was at least a suggestion in the Berkeley speech that, that you're, you see yourself as involved in a kind of a, a healing process. Do, do these roles come in conflict with each other as you make a movie? Uh, one example that comes to mind in your laser disc of Nixon, you have a great scene between Helms and Nixon. Uh, which uh, involves the confrontation between the director of the CIA and the president of the United States. You cut that from the movie. These roles, art, uh, artist, healer, historian, do they conflict? I don't think so. You know, probably when we all were at the very beginning of time, mm -hmm. we were all in this tribe, right? And we all <laughs> sat around the cave and some guy would tell the stories, mm -hmm. you know, it would be Homer would, st would, would, would get there and he'd say, well, there was this great battle and, we, and he did that, that family did this, mm -hmm. and it was probably half of it was bullshit. <laughs> but it went down into the history books because it was a, that was the first dramatic mm -hmm. historian. Sophocles, Aeschylus, Euripides, they were all interpreting their uh, various kings and rulers of their time. Socrates was interpreted by Plato. So where do we cross the line? Where do we get our first histories? And all the first historians were known Mm -hmm. And we're always uh, critiqued from Thucydides on to P uh, Plutarch. All of their stories have been, uh, I mean, they fought over Alexander the Great for centuries as to what his meaning was, because there was the, the anti-Macedonian uh, Greek element, and then there was the pro-Macedonian Iranians. So there was all these, history changed on Alexander through all the last 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. So that's what's going on. It's uh, this interpretive battle. Now, you know, there are facts, yes. There's memos, yes. But don't believe memoirs. <laughs> but even on paper, what do people write? I mean, we're all very careful what we write. You know it, Dem. Mm -hmm. Well, and in government, on the contrary, they would, anything that has to be done seriously would probably be not put on paper as little as possible. It's just in your own interest. Mm -hmm. uh, Nixon ironically bugged himself in order to write his memoirs mm -hmm. to outdo Kissinger, who was worried that it was going to outdo mm -hmm. him. <laughs> it really came down to vanity. And I think that historians underestimate that uh, because I think historians are themselves subject mm -hmm. to vanity. Mm -hmm. They have their own sort of affectation. So in the end, the artist you may just be doing that which was done a long time ago and we've gotten away from. Mr. Stone, thank you very much you, for Harry. taking this time and to pleasure. be with us today. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.